It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Speaker, over 2.2 million Ontarians do not have a family doctor. More than 360,000 of them are children. That number increases each and every month. It will reach 3 million people by 2025, as fewer medical students choose as family practice and more family physicians retire. The growing physician shortage will put more pressure on already overwhelmed hospital, emergency department, urgent care, and even our long-term care homes. Family doctors need this government support to continue to provide top quality care to us, like access to team-based care, like reduced administrative burden, like an electronic health record that actually works. Will this government listen Question. to Ontario family physician and act upon their recommendations? To apply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Not only are we listening, we are working with the OMA, our, uh, our partners in universities. You know, when we made our most uh, recent expansion of residency spots, both students incoming and post-secondary, uh, postgraduate, uh, I had university Prefost and presidents say this is the largest expansion that we, they have seen in their university health uh, expansions in historic numbers. They are thrilled that, as an example, we are seeing more individuals choose to study medicine, and we as a government are committing through residency spots increases to ensure that those uh, young people who want to practice medicine in the province of Ontario have that opportunity here in their response. Community. Thank you. Supplementary question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Minister, more than 500,000 people living in Toronto and Mississauga don't have a family doctor, including over 136,000 of the lowest income earners. Half of the people without a doctor in Toronto and Mississauga live in racialized neighbourhoods. Doctors are only human. They can only take about 1,000 to 1,200 patients, although many doctors have much larger rosters. At this rate, the GTA will need about 400 more doctors to meet the demand in the region. What plan does this government have to immediately recruit hundreds of more doctors in the GTA? Minister of Health. So as we pass Bill 60 this week, it was very exciting to now have the opportunity to have as of right in the province of Ontario. As of right means that physicians who are practicing in other Canadian jurisdictions right now have the opportunity to practice in the province without having to go through the red tape. Why are we making those investments? Because we understand that there are short, medium, and long-term plans that we can put in place, that we have put in place, including an investment of $33 million to make sure that an additional 100 graduates are going to have the positions and availability to practice, train, and teach, and practice in the province of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Next supplementary, final supplementary, member for Kiwetanong. Uh, Miigwetz, uh, Speaker. Uh, in Northern Ontario, um, there was a shortage of uh, 350 uh, family doctors and specialists. Uh, we also know that uh, nursing stations on reserves are staffed by federal and agency nurses. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like this, uh, Speaker. Uh, federal nurses have to reach out to on-call doctors by phone to provide a diagnosis. That's, that's normal in the North. The, the doctor shortage um, leads to unnecessary suffering. Speaker, it leads to unnecessary deaths of patients in the far Northern Ontario. I ask, how is this government going to imme Question. immediately help the people of Northern Ontario the suffering because of the doctor shortage? Mr. Pell. Now, since 2018, Speaker, we have added an additional 1,800 physicians in the province of Ontario. We have 
put in place programs specifically for Northern Ontario to match emergency department with peer-to-peer -peer ED doctors to make sure that they have access to peers who are there for them to be able to work through issues and problems as they appear before their emergency departments. We'll continue to do that work. It is not one issue. It is not one solution. We are doing everything with our partners, including in a partnership to increase family medicine by a partnership between Queen's University and Lake Ridge that actually is focused on training new family docs to make sure Response. that we have the capacity in the province of Ontario to serve our growing population. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Nearly 65,000 people in Kitchener Waterloo do not have a doctor. A quarter of those people are among the lowest income earners. They can't afford to pay. They can't afford to pay an annual subscription to a clinic or fees for virtual care. Thousands of people who could be getting proactive, preventative care are going to the emergency room when their illnesses have progressed. So many lives can be saved with early intervention. What will this government do to support family doctors to hire more Order. administrative and clinical support so that they spend more time with their parent, patients, as the Ontario College of Family Physicians has recommended this government do? Great question. The Minister of Colleges and Universities. For that question. I find it very rich coming from the opposition today. Well, every one of you stood up yesterday and voted against Bill 60. Order. If you had read the bill, do you understand? The I'll ask the Minister to take her seat. I'll ask the official opposition to come to order. Minister of Colleges and Universities can conclude her answer. By passing Bill 60, we are adding an additional 24,000 PSWs, 1,000 registered nurses, 500 RPNs, 455 new physicians, 52 uh, new physician assistants, and 150 nurse practitioners. You're asking us what we're doing. You're voting against every Order. single measure we take. Stop the clock. Members, will please take their seats. The House will come to order. Restart the clock. The supplementary question, Member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, the shortage of family doctors puts additional pressure on our hospitals and emergency rooms. Angie, in my community, went to Lake Ridge Hospital's ER with chest pains and emailed me while waiting in eMERGE. She was told only one doctor was on duty and there were 119 patients waiting. I wonder how many of those people could have received faster care or avoided the ER if they were able to have seen a family doctor. So, Premier, over 44,000 people in Durham Region don't have a family doctor. Can I tell people who are writing to their MPPs from the emergency room to keep waiting or that help is on the way? Thank you. Mr. Bell. No, this, uh, this is really an important opportunity to highlight the many different programs that we put in place to assist our ED physicians, to assist our hospitals, to assist our paramedics. Uh, one of them I would highlight is, of course, the dedicated offload nursing program, funding program. specifically to ensure that a nurse, a respiratory technician, or a paramedic is offloading and taking care of those patients to ensure the paramedics can get back into community. Another one, of course, is the 911 models of care, where we don't just force paramedics to take individuals Order. to emergency departments. We have the opportunity now, whether it is for long-term care, palliative, and now actually expanding it into diabetes and epilepsy. I understand the members opposite don't want to hear the good things that are happening in the province of Ontario, but I will tell you that I am getting feedback that says these changes are making a difference and are working. Stop the clock. The member for Waterloo will come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The member for Brantford Brant will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. Restart the clock. The final supplementary. The member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. 
The region of Thunder Bay has at least 45,000 people without access to primary care. Greenstone is losing two doctors at the end of the month, and seniors are being left without access to any care whatsoever. There are solutions. Further increase enrollment and create a Learn and Stay program for doctors at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Establish more nurse practitioner-led clinics. Reduce the administrative burden on doctors and create a centralized electronic records and referral system now, not in five years. That's right. That's right. Will Will come to order. Finally, invest in the solutions so clearly identified by medical professionals that are not happening now. Order. Minister of Health. Speaker, Northern Ontario School of Medicine. 20 additional residency here, 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 spots here. were just announced. in this chamber that doesn't understand and appreciate with a growing and aging population, we need to do better. What I will say to the NDP and the Liberals is, where would we have been if they hadn't cut those 50 residency spots? We would have had 250 additional practitioners in the province today. We're putting the work in, we're making those investments, and the member opposite can either choose to work with us or continue to complain. But you will see that there are already improvements happening in community because we are making the investment as a government. Response. Again, the member for Brantford Grant come to order, the member for Waterloo come to order. The next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just heard the Minister of Health talk about getting care into communities. And we have people from Minden today whose emergency room is being shut down. You're taking the care out of their community, and it's absolutely shameful. When I asked in this House about the closure of the Minden emergency last week, the Minister of Health said that the decision was made at the local level and refused to take responsibility for it. But the Ontario Health Coalition informs me that this is the first time in Ontario that a Minister of Health has refused to take responsibility for a hospital closure. Because of this closure, lives will be at risk over the summer because of the long ride to the Halliburton Hospital. Does the minister understand that those lives will be her responsibility? Minister of Health. Speaker, while I appreciate that I cannot correct a member's opposite record, the Minden Hospital is not closing. I want to be clear. The local decision made by hospital leadership supported by a volunteer voted board has made a determination that in Hamilton Health Science they want sorry Halliburton Health Science they want to combine Minden and Halliburton Emergency Department all of the other critically important services that currently happen in the Minden Hospital will continue to happen in the Minden Hospital. There is no doubt Order. that when changes happen, including emergency department closures, it is very challenging for the community. But I want to reassure and remind the member opposite that these are local decisions made Response. by local leadership, local hospitals. Official opposition come to order. The supplementary question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. The emergency department in Minden needs to stay open. A police officer arrives at Malcolm Training Centre for pistol, carbine, or rifle training. Sometimes things go wrong. There are 11 minutes to the emergency department in Minden. The brand new Nesbitt Arena has tournament and training camp all year round. A kids get hurt. It is three minutes' drive to the Minden Emergency Department. The 62 residents who live at Highland Crest Long-Term Care needs urgent care. It's a zero-minute drive. They are attached to the hospital, but they won't be able to go there anymore. The residents of Minden and all over surrounding area are here today at Queen's Park. They came to Queen's Park to ask for the minister's help. They want her to use her power as Minister of Health to put a one-year moratorium Order. on the closure of the Emergency Question. Department of Minden Hospital. Will she listen to them? Will she help them? Members, will please take their seats. Minister of Health. 
You know, Speaker, so often in this chamber we talk about the importance and value of community leadership, of ensuring that community has a voice. And now Order. the member opposite is suggesting Order. that we need to override community hospital leadership decisions and board supported decisions. Position come to order. It is very unfortunate that they have not supported the local decision made by hospital leadership at the Halliburton Health Sciences. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member for Ottawa Centre, come to order. Member for Windsor West, come to order. The next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Ontario is home to a world-class life sciences sector, with our researchers continually pushing the envelope for uh, better health outcomes for all. But if there's anything that the last few years have shown us, it's the importance of having an established medical manufacturing sector that tops the life sciences agenda. That's why last week's Moderna announcement was so welcomed. Speaker, will the minister please speak further to the progress that this government is making to ensure that Ontario will never again be left behind and left reliant on others for critical goods? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, supply chain issues caused by the pandemic created global shortages of many vital health care devices. One such shortage was epidural catheters, the medical standard when it comes to providing adequate pain relief during labour, or so we've been told. We put out a call, Speaker, to reshore manufacturing of epidurals right here in Ontario, and one company, Canadian Hospital Specialties, answered that call and will now manufacture epidural catheters at their plant in Oakville. Now, last week, with our MPPs from Oakville and Oakville North Burlington, CHS announced a $1.5 million investment to fill that critical supply gap and hire 10 people along the way. What a great Spons. example, Speaker, of seeing a problem and solving it right here in Ontario. Premier Ford calls that the Ontario spirit. The supplementary question. And, and thanks uh, to the minister for his answer uh, and, quite frankly, for his leadership on the file. Uh, it's great news that Ontario will now domestically produce epidural catheters. This announcement is a welcome relief to hospitals who struggled to manage their supply of epidural catheters and secure inventory. Because of the leadership demonstrated by the Premier and this minister, Ontario manufacturers have begun to produce an increasing number of critical medical supplies. Speaker, with the ongoing rollout of the life sciences strategy, what further initiatives can we expect to see from our government as we continue to bolster our manufacturing industry, create jobs, and position Ontario as a world leader in the medtech and biotech sectors? Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, Ontario has a very rich history of life-saving medical breakthroughs, from discovering insulin right here in Toronto to detecting the gene that causes cystic fibrosis to developing the world's first cardiac pacemaker. Millions of lives have been vastly improved because of the groundbreaking work being done right here in Ontario's life sciences sector. Our new Life Sciences Council will help to accelerate communication, commercialization, and encourage adoption of made-in-Ontario health innovations. Much like when we did the auto sector's driving prosperity plan, we've now introduced taking life sciences to the next level, and it's their plan for Ontario's first life sciences strategy in over Response. a decade. Speaker, this will ensure that Ontario is the global life sciences centre for our world's innovators. Thank you. The next question, member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Five years after paying deposits to Great Wise Developments, home, de home buyers in Ottawa West Nepean are still waiting for their promised homes. They've been sent notice of delay after notice of delay, with no delivery date currently provided. The developer also gave inaccurate information, blaming the city for delays when actually the developer failed to file the permits. My constituents complained to the Home Construction Regulatory Authority, expecting some support. Instead, 22 months later, they haven't even received a decision. 
Why is the Premier continuing to allow unscrupulous developers to run roughshod over Ontarians who just want to move into their new homes? opposite for the, the question. Speaker, it is this government that believes all Ontarians deserve a home and will not waver when it comes to protecting new home buyers' investment in their future. Uh, speaker, under this Premier, it is this government that is not only committed to building 1.5 million homes, new homes, but it is adding new ways to improve protection for Ontarians across our province. Speaker, the changes we implemented over the last few months have put bad developers on notice and made bad developers think twice before trying to take advantage of our home buyers. Speaker, hardworking Ontarians can rest assured that our government has their back Response. when they make the biggest purchase of their life and with or without the support of the opposition. Supplementary question. Two years to get a decision from the HCRA isn't protecting anyone but developers, Speaker. That's right. It gets worse. While my constituents are in limbo, receiving bad information or no information, a clause in the contract allows the developer to unilaterally cancel the home purchase if the developer believes that there is a dispute between the home buyer and the developer. This means that if my constituents speak up publicly, they lose their new homes. It is unfair that a developer can behave with impunity and then take away someone's home if they complain. Will the Premier protect home buyers in Ontario by banning gag order clauses from home sales contracts? Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, for the question. Uh, speaker, the member opposite has a, a lot to say about helping Ontarians, but when push comes to shove, they choose to play politics rather than vote for real support for Ontarians. When, speaker, when our great Order. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing introduced a bill in the fall that would Order. not only punish bad developers with fines of hundreds or thousands of dollars, uh, Speaker, for the very first time the Position money would go order. back into the pockets of the affected in individuals. Yep. What did the member opposite do? Right. They voted against that yeah. bill, Mr. Speaker. They voted against stronger protection for the people of this province, yeah. voted against providing Spons. families the relief they needed in, the, in this bill, uh, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, on this side and on that side as well, too, we are here. Order. Opposition come to order. The House will come to order. The next question. Next question. The member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Honourable Premier. Peel Region is one of Ontario's fastest growing municipalities, and over the next few years, we know that thousands of individuals, families, and newcomers to Canada will settle in our communities. With an abundance of job opportunities available along thriving businesses, community organizations, schools, healthcare facilities that are already there, Peel Region is a great place to call home. However, we know that there's a shortage of available housing throughout Peel Region and throughout Ontario. For too many Ontarians, Finding the right home is still too challenging. Our government must keep moving ahead with measures to tackle the critical shortage in housing. Speaker, can the Premier explain how our government is increasing Ontario's housing supply? Thank you. Reply, the Premier. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Brampton East. You're doing a fantastic job. Matter of fact, all five members from Brampton are doing a great job. Mr. Speaker, we're, we're in a housing crisis right now, a desperate housing crisis. No matter if it's new Canadians coming in or young people looking for a house to buy and they just can't afford it, it's very simple, Mr. Speaker. It's supply and demand. We're going to build the 1.5 million homes. Mr. Speaker, we, we've set a record here in Ontario 
We're the fastest growing region in North America, not just in Canada, not in Ontario, but in North America. 445,000 people moved into our great province last year. The reason being, Mr. Speaker, that's where they see the economic growth in North America, right here. Because of my great friend, right beside me, Minister of Economic Order. Development, have brought 600, 650,000 more people are working today than they were under the previous Liberal government. <laughs> the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's good news that so many housing projects are underway and that our government is creating conditions for more construction to take place. This will benefit my community of Brampton East and benefit other communities across our great province. Rapidly growing communities like mine need access to convenient transportation networks. The previous Liberal government ignored the need to build and expand vital transportation infrastructure like roads, highways, to keep up with future growth. Their failure to address the needs and expansions, uh, expansions to public transit and highway network is making life inconvenient for individuals, families and businesses. Transportation infrastructure is vital to address the highway congestion, create jobs and support Ontario's economy. Speaker, can the Premier please explain how our government is building stronger transportation network which will further support our communities? Again. Premier. Again, another great question from the member from Brampton East. M Mr. Speaker, as we see the population grow, as we see the economy grow, we need to get people from point A to point B. Through our great Minister of Transportation, Minister of Infrastructure, we're spending over $184 billion not just building new highways like the 413 or the Bradford Bypass, but also where I was uh, yesterday, Kitchener-Waterloo, we're building Highway 7. In southwestern Ontario, we're widening Highway 3. Mr. Speaker, we're pouring money into infrastructure, no matter if it's the 50 projects and the $50 billion through new hospitals and expansions or long-term care, Minister of Long-Term Care. The previous government built, what, 618 in 12 years? Order. We're building 68,000 new long-term care homes. Make sure that when the population grows, they have a Response. place to live and call home, Mr. Speaker. Right now, Ontario is on fire, here, here. and we're going to continue making sure the economy grows, putting money back in the people's pockets. Here, here. Order. The next question, the next member for University of Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. A new report uh, by the City of Toronto is raising fears that the Conservatives want to override Toronto's laws and make it easier for developers to knock down rental buildings, kick out tenants and replace rent-controlled homes with luxury condos. When renters are facing a demolition, they need better protections, not an eviction notice. To make our city more affordable, can this government commit to strengthening municipal rental replacement laws instead of weakening them? Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, we have uh, not made any changes to existing rent replacement bylaws that are currently in effect in some municipalities. They remain in place. Uh, in fact, uh, we're proposing to build on those bylaws by uh, explicitly requiring that municipal rental replacement bylaws include compensation and the right for the tenant to move back in at the same rent. For example, we're exploring right now a framework where a municipality could require that replacement units have the same core features, like the same number of uh, bedrooms, as they did previously, and requiring that tenants are given the right of first refusal to move into that new modern uh, accommodation at a similar rent. Those are the facts, Speaker. Those are the rules. The supplementary question. Um, Minister, we're currently debating a bill where you're looking, looking at taking these uh, rental protections away, so that's a very interesting response. Uh, my question is back to, the, back to the Premier. Average rents in Toronto have reached an alarming high of $3,000 a month, which means losing your home to demolition is devastating. Right now, there are 73 rental homes approved for demolition and conversion in Toronto, putting over 3,400 rental homes at risk. Tenants living Order. in buildings like those at 55 Brownlow, 25 St Mary's and 145 St George are rallying at City Hall today because they want to save their homes. I'm going to ask the minister again. Can you commit to strengthening rental Question. protections when a tenant is facing a demolition, instead of weakening them. 
Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. You know, again, Speaker, I have to continue with this member uh, to express the facts uh, about what this government is is doing. And again, you know, the question okay. I have back to her is, you know, um, are you going to support? the tenant protection measures that this government are putting into Bill 97. Do you support the tremendous work that the Attorney General has done to ensure that the Landlord-Tenant Board moves forward with double the amount of adjudicators yeah. and also staff support to deal with the backlog? That's the question before the House. Do you support tenant protections, yes or no? The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. I rise for the third time since last August to ask about the reconstruction of the Caledonia Argyle Street Bridge. Speaker, I will continue to stand in this House on this issue until reconstruction begins because it's a matter of safety. Speaker, last August, the minister said the detailed design of the Argyle Street replacement was already complete and that the ministry was in the process of obtaining final approvals to proceed to construction. The minister also said, and I quote, we will not take any shortcuts when it comes to getting critical infrastructure built. Speaker, the ministry may not take shortcuts, but the long way around could see this bridge collapse under this government's watch. My constituents are fearful to cross the bridge, and they become anxious when they are stopped in the middle during bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the holdup, and what is the date reconstruction will begin? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member opposite uh, for her important question. Our government understands the importance of the Argyle Street Bridge in her riding, as Argyle Street is the main street that connects Caledonia and Haldeman County. Mr. Speaker, the bridge remains safe for limited use, including emergency services ve service vehicles. The bridge is closely monitored by MTO, and load limit restrictions are enforced, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, as the member opposite knows, for years, the previous Liberal government simply ignored important infrastructure investments like this one in rural Ontario. This bridge, which was built in 1927, Mr. Speaker, has reached the end of its service life and it needs to be replaced. That's why our government is saying yes to making these investments in rural Ontario, and that's why we're Response. investing in replacing the concrete Argyle Street Bridge with a new five span steel arch bridge. Supplementary question? Thank you, Speaker. Once again, this is cold comfort with respect to a reconstruction project that is more than 20 years overdue. The ministry has said it's a, it's a priority, and the minister said that again. This government has had five years to get the job done, and yet reconstruction is sitting idling. The ministry, the ministry staff has said that the structure is safe, and the minister alluded to it this morning by saying that some traffic, including emergency services, pro provided that the load restriction is followed and enforced, the bridge is safe. The truth is, the majority of Haldeman County is crossing over that bridge on a daily basis. If the bridge is only safe if load restrictions are followed, the travelling public has a right to know how many infractions have occurred and are occurring on a daily basis. Locals know what is travelling that bridge. Speaker, through Question. you to the minister, how many fines have been issued since the load restrictions were put in place? Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I can report that the ministry has not observed uh, a high rate of offenders. The ministry has installed an electronic road monitoring system to assist with load restriction enforcement, the issue that the member opposite is raising. Letters are sent to commercial vehicle operators reminding them of the posted load restrictions, load limit restrictions. And all commercial vehicles that are repeatedly found to be in violation of the restrictions after receiving the notification letters may face sanctions and the loss of their permission to operate their commercial vehicle, Mr. Speaker. I can assure the member opposite, as well as all members of this House, that safety has always been and will continue to be our top priority. Okay. The next question, the member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. Public transit is the primary form of travel for many people living in my riding of Markham Thornhill, and also for many people living in across the GTA. It should be easy for them to travel across the entire transit network. 
It should be easy for them to travel, not only for transit network, make it easier. However, the transit system, fair system, under the different transit agency is unfortunately inconsistent. This leads to confusion and misunderstanding so many individuals. People who rely on the public transit are continuing on our government to remove barriers so that using public transit is simple and inconvenient. Mr. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please Question. share what our government is doing to deliver more options for riders to make transit more convenient experience in Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Associate Minister of Transportation to respond. Thank you, Speaker. I'm very happy to talk about transit this morning, a much better subject than talking about hockey. <laughs> Speaker, through last summer and into this winter, we introduced Presto's credit card tap option for riders on the GO network in 905 with terrific success, and over one million credit card taps have successfully been logged. Uh, Speaker, I'm happy to say that last Tuesday, our government, under the leadership of this Premier, launched a debit tap feature on Presto and GO Transit and major uh, local transit agencies on, in the 905. That includes York Region, Speaker, in that member's riding. Speaker, this is game-changing stuff, changing the way that people are able to get from point A to point B and pay their transit fares with a simple tap of a debit card or a credit card. Riders can now take transit, get to work, school appointments, Everything in between. I meant to say tap, of course, Speaker. Uh, this is uh, something that the Liberals Response. simply didn't do. They left behind the commuters of this province. This government won't do the same. We're building record transit and making the experience better all along. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. It is a good news that our government is providing new payment options that make it easier to travel on the public transit network. Access to more payment options is long overdue and is important to many individuals and families. Public transit is an essential service, and our government must continue to invest in public transit infrastructure so that many people can better to connect to jobs and the travel. Mr. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain what our government is doing to ensure that reliable and convenient transit service available for all Ontarians? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Transportation. Uh, speaker, the member is absolutely right. The world moves at a fast uh, pace, and there are there's a language young people today are speaking that I don't really understand. There are things being developed that are very quick and tough, difficult to keep up with. <laughs> Government has a responsibility to keep up with the times. That's why we can't limit ourselves to just paying for transit through physical cards. That's why people on the go, 905, uh, and and the uh, Up Express network can now use their credit and debit cards and smartphone or smart devices with a simple tap of your smart device to ride transit speaker. It doesn't end there because the new Presto devices are also being installed on the TTC to deliver new payment options like credit, debit, and smart pay to Toronto riders later this year. Thanks. Progress has been very solid. In fact, Speaker, I'm, I'm glad to uh, update the House that the hardware refresh has been completed on Response. buses and streetcars. The work is ongoing for stations. Unlike the down bad opposition, Speaker, this government is getting it done for commuters in Ontario. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last year, we learned Ocher Villa, owned by Southbridge and one of the worst private long-term care operators in our province, wants a 30-year license renewal. Now Southbridge wants an MZO from the province to expedite a planned expansion. Pickering Council saw firsthand the neglect that this company and firmly said no to their plan at a recent council meeting. Speaker, will the Premier listen to the concerns of residents, families, and the city of Pickering, or does he plan to renew these dangerous for-profit homes with a 30-year license renewal and fast-track expansion. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the member opposite. But let me be very, very, very clear. The Premier of this province uh, gave me a very clear mandate to ensure that I built 60,000 new and upgraded long-term care beds across the province of Ontario. Part of that mandate was to increase the level of care to four hours, Mr. Speaker. Part of that mandate was to hire 27,000 additional health care providers, health care workers for those 60,000 new beds, Mr. Speaker. And let me be clear to the people of Pickering. They are waiting for a long-term care home. What we are talking about here, Mr. Speaker, is tearing down an old outdated home, the Orchard Villa, and replacing it with a brand new state-of-the-art home for the people of Pickering. 
Let me be very clear to the member opposite. Although he is opposed to this, I will do whatever it takes to remove the obstacles to make sure that that home is built because the people of Pickering deserve nothing less. Order. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, I just want to stop the dying in these long term care homes. Back to the Premier. The Premier wants to build more beds, but under a private for profit Order. owner, Operator, those are just more beds for seniors to die in. And to the to the minister and the premier, look at the history of this company. Military intervention, yep. bed bugs, Shame. staff shortage, rotten food, residents left in spoiled diapers, class action lawsuit. Eighty residents died. Some from dehydration. Shame. It seems likely the government will not only grant them a 30-year renewal, but advocate for them to expand further. We know the public, not for the profit system, is safer. How can the Premier justify even considering renewing Ocho Orchard Villa license? How can you even consider that? Mr. Long-Term Care. So to be very clear, the very same unionized people, the Ontario Nurses Association, the SEIAU, they work in the same long-term care home that he is now criticizing, Mr. Speaker. Let's be very clear about that. What we are talking Order. about in Pickering Order. is tearing down an old outdated home that should have been torn down long before we came to office, Mr. Speaker. That is what he is advocating against, Mr. Speaker, and this really isn't the first time in Pickering. We have two applications Order. for brand new homes in front of Pickering Council. One was this uh, brand new Orchard Villa. The second Order. one was an Afro-Caribbean centered home, the first of its kind in Ontario, and they turned it down. That is who the NDP are protecting, Mr. Speaker. What I'm going to do is tell this member, tell the NDP and tell Pickering Council Order. very clearly. The Premier gave me a mandate to build 60,000 new Response. homes for seniors across Ontario. I'll remove the obstacles and I will get it done despite the fact. Stop the clock. Order. Members, Niagara Falls, come to order. The government house leader will come to order. The member for Niagara Falls will come to order. The government house leader will come to order. Thank you. The next question. Start the clock. Sadly, I'm hearing concerns from the people of my community about increased criminal activity. Of course, the issue extends beyond our local community of Brampton East. We've all heard media reports about the rise on attacks of religious institutions and hateful graffiti. Hate-motivated incidents that target individuals, families, and businesses based on their ethnicity, religion, race, gender, have many feeling vulnerable and threatened. The public safety of all Ontarians must be our government's highest priority. The people of my community and all Ontarians are counting on our government to support uh, for support and solutions. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain how our government is addressing crime and increasing protection for Ontario communities? To reply, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my friend from Brampton East for his question. And as I've said before, everyone in Ontario has a right to feel safe, free from harassment, hate, and discrimination. And that's why we're building an Ontario for everyone, where everyone belongs and everyone can contribute and prosper. This is our Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure this House that our police work day and night to protect all Ontarians from violence, and this government will always have the backs of everyone that keeps Ontario safe. And recently, I visited Ontario Police College, where I saw for myself the police training, the training for investigations and hate crimes, so that they are prepared to keep us safe. Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. Our government has a zero tolerance towards hate and violence of any kind. Hey, hey. Hey. Thank you, Speaker. 
and I appreciate the Solicitor General's direct response in addressing this very serious issue and his continuous efforts in keeping all Ontarians safe. It's reassuring that our, our police services are well trained and well equipped to protect our communities. We value the dedication and service of our frontline police officers. Ontario is one of the most diverse places in the world, and everyone is responsible to be respectful and welcoming to all. The words and actions that we all, that we all use must help build a stronger, safer, and more inclusive communities across our province. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain what other actions our government is, is taking to support the safety and protection of all Ontarians? Attaboy. Solicitor General. I'm proud to say that just last Friday, I joined our great Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism in announcing a new $25 million anti-hate security prevention grant. And this grant will help religious and cultural organizations enhance safety and security measures to prevent hateful incidents. We were joined in that announcement by leaders of multi-faiths. Our government is working on all fronts to combat hate, and I commend my colleague for this initiative. Let me be clear, there is no excuse for anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism of any kind. It's totally unacceptable. Hate is toxic to our democracy. And if anyone here or anywhere engages in this type of behavior who feels you can double down or triple down on this, we have a message Spons. for you. We will call you out. Yeah. Yeah. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member from Mishkigawak, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Premier. Once again, Due to flooding, the community of Kisheshwan had to be evacuated, evacuated to multiple communities across northern Ontario. Families with children are bound to live in the hotel rooms with recurring issues, the spring flooding. Five years ago, the federal and provincial government with Kisheshwan signed an agreement to move the community to a safer location. My question, Premier, what has your government done in those five years to move Kisheshwan to their new location? Minister of Northern Development, Mr. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we support the uh, ongo ongoing logistical challenges uh, of that community, uh, there is no question that there is a need uh, for us to move on that location. Us involves the community itself and some neighboring communities. The federal government, the provincial government, remain committed to that process and continue to work with the, uh, not just Kasechuan, but Albany First Nation to ensure. Uh, that they uh, actually want to do this, and we can proceed with a couple of uh, important processes uh, to make that move. Uh, our door remains open, and we'd like to facilitate that process. It shouldn't take this long. It's twice in my own political career that this has happened, and I can assure the member opposite that we remain committed to facilitating that, providing it has the support of the nearby communities uh, to Kasechuan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Again to the Premier. I had the opportunity to speak to committee members of Kasheshwan that had been evacuated in Campus Kaysen. They tell me that nothing has been done. The road, the road has not even been built to access the new site. Premier, what will your government do to expedite the moving of the community that has to be evacuated year after year due to flooding? Mr. Development. First of all, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the, the, the City of Timmins, Cochrane, Kapiskasing, Valrita, and Thunder Bay for their extraordinary uh, efforts to support the move. I think that's the thing that should be acknowledged first and foremost in this place. People do tremendous work, volunteers. It's a real community-based effort. But frankly, Mr. Speaker, we continue to urge, uh, particularly Fort Albany First Nation, uh, to work with Kasechuan First Nation so that we can proceed with things like the environmental uh, processes that are required to actually build the road that the member speaks about. It's not that nothing is being done. Efforts are being made to get things started. That's been going on for a couple of years. I suspect the member knows that. 
and we'd be happy to have a conversation with the leadership of those First Nations communities to trigger those Bonds. processes and move that community to a place where we signed on the dotted line, Mr. Speaker, that we were committed to do that. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. Number four, Brampton North. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. Uh, as Ontario faces an affordable housing crisis, individuals and families are struggling to keep pace with the cost of housing due to rising mortgage and interest rates. These economic challenges are, unfortunately, preventing many hardworking Ontarians from achieving the goal of home ownership. Unfortunately, years of inaction by the previous Liberal government left vulnerable individuals without the housing supports that they desperately need. That's why it's crucial for our government to take immediate action to increase the construction of safe, stable and affordable housing for those at risk. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please share what steps our government is taking to deliver great housing supply to Ontarians? The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I really want, do want to thank the member from Brampton North for this very important question. Speaker, it was a pleasure to be joined with my Peel caucus colleagues and representatives from the region's municipalities last month to echo our government's investment of an additional $202 million every year into our homelessness prevention and Indigenous supportive housing program. This brings our total annual investment to nearly $700 million. But, Speaker, this funding is yes, it's record investments. But, Speaker, this funding is vital as it helps service managers like the Regional Municipality of Peel provide supportive housing and other supports for people experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Speaker, we know that supportive housing provides stability that opens doors to better health employment and independence Bonds. for those in need. That's why our government is stepping up and delivering greater investments to the people of this province that benefits our communities and our economy as a whole. Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks to the minister uh, for that answer. And you know that 38% uh, increase for Peel is just massive for the region, massive for the community. I was happy to be there with the minister uh, and a lot of Peel caucus colleagues as well. And, Good gosh, Speaker, after that election, we got a lot of PC caucus members in Peel, don't we? Now, these investments are welcome news, and they demonstrate our government's commitment to provide support to the housing needs of all Ontarians. However, many constituents in my riding of Brampton North are very concerned about the surging costs of rent and mortgage uh, interest rates. Now, many of it, individuals and families are worried about finding an affordable place to live. That's why our government must take urgent action to support those who are experiencing hardships and implement practical and long-term solutions to address homelessness. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on what our government is doing to improve housing services for the people of Ontario? The Minister of Housing. Thank you, Speaker. And once again, thank you to the member from Brampton North for his question. Our government met with partners and stakeholders right across our province this past fall, and their valuable feedback was key to our improvements to Ontario's supportive housing system. We recognize that the availability and affordability of housing are closely linked to the supply of homes in our communities, and that's why we're committed to increasing the supply of housing in the coming 10 years. We're pleased to see that many municipalities in Ontario share this goal, like Brampton, Mississauga and Caledon, who have collectively pledged to build a total of 246,000 units. These pledges, yes. These pledges demonstrate a solid commitment to the increasing housing supply and ensuring that residents have access to affordable housing. Speaker, Response. only by working together can we ensure that all Ontarians have access to safe, affordable and suitable housing. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Last week, the Middlesex London Health Unit wrote to this government urging an increase to social assistance rates. Their letter states, and I quote, Middlesex London residents with low incomes cannot afford to eat after meeting other essential needs. Speaker, at a time of unprecedented inflation, food insecurity in our province is higher than ever before. Our health unit is telling this government that people on ODS 
GSP and Ontario Works are not eating. Speaker, why is this government keeping social assistance rates so low that those who rely on social assistance are forced to go without food? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, this, it's been this government that has been there for every single Ontarian when we said we're not going to leave them behind. Mr. Speaker, I will just remind a member, Mr. Speaker, of all the decisions that they have voted against, Mr. Speaker. First of all, the largest increase to support the most vulnerable here in the, in the province, Mr. Order. Speaker. What did the opposition do? Order. They voted against it. Shame. Then, Mr. Speaker, the, the rates were aligned to inflation, which was the right thing to do to provide okay. more support for Ontarians at a time of high costs and everything okay. as a result Order. of a carbon tax that they supported that we are against, Mr. Speaker. Hey. Time and time and time again, it's this government that's fighting for Ontarians. The NDP will say one thing, Mr. Speaker, when the, when the lights are on and the camera's rolling, and then when it comes to actually voting and Order. supporting Ontarians, they'll, 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 they'll continue to turn their back on them. Shit. Just like they failed to support the Liberals in, in, in 15 years, Mr. Speaker, we said from the beginning. Thank you. Order. Supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Food banks in London and across Ontario are stretched to the limit. In just the last year, the London Food Bank saw a 40 per cent increase in demand. The emergency food cupboard at the Northwest London Resource Centre in my riding is seeing five or six new families a day. When people can't afford food, Speaker, their physical and mental health suffers. It causes more chronic conditions, more non-communicable diseases, more infections, depression, anxiety, and stress. Speaker, will this government listen to the Middlesex Health Unit, lift people on social assistance out of legislated poverty, and increase social assistance rates? Members, will please take their seats. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. $1.2 billion towards, the, uh, towards uh, helping communities through the Social Services Relief Fund, Mr. Speaker. $1.2 billion to help with food, for help with cost of housing, Mr. Speaker. Investing $83 million through the Ontario Trillium Foundation to support, Mr. Speaker, nonprofit organizations, including food banks. $8 million in support for funding Feed Ontario. Mr. Speaker, Every single that we measure that we've taken to help Ontarians during the cost of high Order. prices everywhere, Mr. Speaker, the NDP continuously votes against. They will never support Opposition lowering costs in this province, Mr. Speaker. You've seen them. You've heard them. They'll say one thing here in the House, but as soon as it comes to actions, Mr. Speaker, they're MIA. They don't exist. It's this Premier and it's this government that says we'll make sure that every single Ontarian is supported and no one is left behind. And we'll put our, our, our the next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Red Tape Reduction. Reducing red tape is a key part of building a stronger economy and improving services for all Ontarians. That's why our government must bring forward red tape reduction solutions to deliver on our promise to improve government services and make it easier to do business in Ontario. The Less Red Tape, Stronger Economy Act should help to pave the way for better services, provide greater support for businesses to grow, and help to save people time and money. While it is unfortunate that the opposition does not believe in the benefits of cutting red tape, Shame. this legislation could help ensure Ontario remains a key destination for investment, here, here. opportunity and prosperity. So, Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain how our government is reducing regulatory burdens on people and businesses in Ontario? Thank you. That's a good question. Minister of Red Tape Reduction. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Carleton for that important question. Mr. Speaker, time and again, the only thing we ever hear from the members of the opposite is no. Yep. What they fail to realize is that reducing red tape is about the impact these changes are having on real people and businesses across our great province, Mr. Sure. Speaker. Changes like helping businesses embrace new technologies like carbon capture and storage. Yeah. Reducing red tape on these projects will unleash innovation and it will create hundreds of millions of dollars in new investments right across our great province. While our government knows there is a tremendous economic and environmental potential for carbon storage, 
the opposition wants to keep the red tape barriers in place, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are never going to Response. let that happen. Our government will never stop fighting for a better future for Ontarians and make sure our province is prosperous. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It's clear that the changes our government is making to eliminate red tape are working. For example, <clears throat> excuse me. For example, removing the ban on carbon sequestration enables new technologies and supports Ontario's economic competitiveness. Efforts to reduce unnecessary burdens that are holding back Ontario's economic growth and prosperity are vital, perhaps now more than ever. We saw what happened to our economy when the previous Liberal government inter introduced destructive economic policies and burdensome regulations that made life more difficult. That's why it's so crucial for our government to continue to listen to the people of Ontario and the solutions they bring forward. So through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain how these red tape reduction changes can create real benefits for people and businesses in our province? Thank you. Mr. Red Tape Reduction. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the important question once again, and I always look forward to receiving great ideas, Mr. Speaker, and recommendations from Ontarians right across our great province through our red tape uh, portal on Ontario.ca, Mr. Speaker. And I also want to point out I'm yet to receive a single idea from any of the members on opposite, Mr. Speaker. They don't even have a critic Order. responsible for red tape reduction, Mr. Speaker. While this is disappointing, it is not unexpected. That's because, as we all know, the Liberals, supported by the NDP, came up with the highest burden that the province had in the country, Mr. Speaker. However, since 2018, our government has taken strong action to cut Ontario's regulatory burden by over 16,000 regulatory compliance requirements, Mr. Speaker, which helps businesses, big or small, on average, Mr. Speaker, $700 million annually. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. This question is to the Premier. Young people are particularly vulnerable to permanent brain damage due to diesel fuel exposure. With young people beginning skills trades training as early as grade 11, can the Minister, can the Premier explain to parents why the government has not reduced the diesel exposure limits to the level long recommended by health and safety experts? Mine workers have been lobbying this for years. In fact, members of the United Steel Workers have uh, stickers on their hard hats recommending the, the uh, reduced, much reduced from the level that the government has recently moved to. So, for me, particularly knowing how uh, badly WSIB is serving the Question. interests of, of uh, injured workers, I can't imagine how parents will feel. My question is, why has the uh, ministry not moved the rate down to the recommended level? Mr. Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the health and safety of every worker is our government's top priority. That's why I was proud uh, to go to Sudbury to be joined by the uh, Minister of Mines to stand with the United Steelworkers Union uh, to lower diesel particulate uh, requirements uh, in mines to the uh, toughest uh, standards in all of North America. This was a request by the United Steelworkers Union. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to pay tribute to those 29,000 miners across northern Ontario that are uh, building the future of this province. They are uh, well-paying jobs with pensions and benefits. These are the jobs that our government, uh, under the leadership of Premier Ford, uh, is investing in to ensure that we have more young people joining these amazing careers out there. As we've said before, and as the Premier often says, when you have a career in the skilled trades, you have a career for life. Member for Markham Unionville has a point of order. I would like to invite members to join the delegation from Lucas, Ontario, for a group picture at the Grand Stairs after the question period. Thank you. Member for Newmarket Aurora has a point of order. 
Yes, thank you, Speaker. I would like to introduce one of my constituents, William Holm, who just made it to the gallery with his group, Community Living. Welcome to the chamber, William, and I hope you enjoy your day at the legislature. University of the Environment, Conservation and Parks apparently has a point of order. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. My apologies. I'd like to welcome Robert Smith to the legislature. I'm having lunch with. He's with uh, Community Living as well. I look forward to speaking with you later today. Thanks for being here. Be Member for Scarborough Centre appears to have a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to remind the House that um, 247, the Nigerian delegation, is there, and you're welcome to join us there today. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a deferred vote now on a motion for closure on the motion for third reading of Bill 71, an act to amend the Mining Act. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.